Hi guys! Welcome to another virtual program at Delaware Seashore State Park. My name's Laura, I'm the Interpretive Programs Manager here at the park. And today I'm going to talk to you about one of uh, the most loved animals that is in our park here. It is known as the Diamondback Terrapin. And it is a brackish water turtle. It is not the only species of turtle that we have here in the park. Uh, we do have box turtles, mud turtles, snapping turtles, but the diamondback terrapin is by far the most populous. And I'm gonna talk about a, a little bit about why uh, this is great habitat here in the park for the terrapins and uh, some of the challenges that they face as well. So right now, water temperature is still a little chilly. So unfortunately, I wasn't able to find a live terrapin for you today. Um, however, I have the next best thing. Um, I have a terrapin shell. Uh, however, if you want to impress your friends with some scientific terms, the top of a terrapin shell is actually called the carapace, and the bottom portion is called the plastron. And this shell here, you can see that the plastron is very rigid. There's no hinge in it. For those of you that might be familiar with box turtles or mud turtles, they have a hinge right around here that allows them to completely enclose themselves into the shell. And uh, this one, they are not able to do that. Um, same with snapping turtles. They're not able to completely enclose themselves inside the shell, but that's okay. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Um, now, if you're not familiar with terrapins, let's talk a little bit about how to identify them. Um, one easy way is to look at their mouth. They have big white lips. The other species of turtles in our park, they don't have those big white lips. Another thing that you can do is uh, you can actually tell the difference between male and female. And the way you do that is uh, if you have a live terrapin, you want to take a look at the tail. Uh, the tail is going to be long and fat on a male, and it's going to be kind of short and skinny on a female. Um, also, if you have a terrapin that's about this size or larger, that's going to be a female. The females actually get a bit larger than the males. And so if you have a turtle that's this size or larger, definitely a female. If you have a smaller one, it could be a male. It also could be a female that's not full grown yet. So just keep that in mind. Um, now these turtles are exclusively brackish water turtles. And the water that we have here in our inland bays are, is definitely brackish. And uh, brackish meaning it's a mix of salt water and fresh water. So it's salty, but not as salty as the ocean. And so these terrapins, that is, that is their ideal place to be. Um, and so that's why they're so populous here in our park amongst all of this brackish water. So that's one reason why this park is great habitat for these guys. But let's dive a little bit deeper. So when you, if you Google habitat and the meaning of it and you start learning about it, there's four components to a successful habitat. That's food, water, shelter, and space. So let's talk about that. First one, food. These guys, they love to eat um, and they are carnivorous, meaning they eat mostly meat. Um, they stay away from the vegetables for the most part. And uh, their favorite food, I mean, they'll eat small crabs, small fish, but their favorite food is actually going to be um, snails. We have uh, the most common snail is gonna be the Eastern mud snail. Um, that's these little guys right here. And then another snail that we have is the marsh periwinkle. Um, usually you'll find those in the grasses. Sometimes they'll actually be crawling up the blades of marsh grass. Um, but this is by far their favorite food. And um, it is very prevalent. These snails are very prevalent in this area. So good, we've got food. Next thing on the list is water. Well, clearly we have a lot of water here. Um, but we all know that if you and I started drinking this water for hydration, that's counterintuitive. Not good to drink salty water. Um, however, terrapins have this really cool adaptation that actually, it's, it's like a salt gland right in the corner of their eye, and they can intake water and then they can excrete. They expel the extra salt through this salt gland. It's almost like they're crying out the extra salt, and that allows them to uh, stay hydrated. And um, other turtles like sea turtles have that same adaptation. And it allows these terrapins to be able to 
Osmoregulate, another scientific term for you. Um, as they move around the bay and they're, tr they're swimming into areas of different levels of salinity. So that's a really cool adaptation for these guys. So four components of habitat, food, check, water, check. Next thing is shelter. Well, a lot of people think, okay, turtles, they, they carry their house on their back. Um, that is their shelter. Um, however, re remember that their, their plastron is not hinged, and so they're not able to completely enclose themselves inside. Um, but it does provide some protection. Another thing, another form of shelter is vegetation. So when terrapins hatch, when they first hatch, they're about mm, the size of a quarter. They're very small, they're really cute. And uh, they need protection. They're easy prey for birds, for raccoons, other things. And so the vegetation in the, the grasses of the salt marsh and some submerged vegetation in the bays can act as great shelter for these terrapins. So we've got food, water, shelter, and the last thing, what was it called? Space. So we have plenty of space in this park. Space is key for any thriving population. Um, if you don't have enough space, you're not gonna have a thriving population. And we are so lucky in this park to have this six and a half mile stretch of undeveloped land. And uh, amongst all the development that is happening in Sussex County, this is like an oasis for these terrapins. And so that is the space that they have in their habitat. So we have an awesome habitat here. We've got food, water, shelter, and space. I keep talking about how this park is such an oasis, but if you remember in the beginning, I mentioned that there are some challenges. Um, can anybody kind of guess what a challenge in this park might be? You guessed right, it is Route 1, the highway. Uh, so, why does that matter? They're staying in the bay for the most part, aren't they? Yeah, mostly. Uh, most of these guys are gonna stay in the water, in the marshes. Um, they're not headed towards the highway all that often, except for one time of year. And we talked about a thriving population. And another thing you need to have a thriving population is for these terrapins to be able to reproduce. And so once the weather gets a bit warmer um, and water temperature is warmer, air temperature is warmer, these, the females are gonna start coming out of the base looking for a nice sandy spot to lay their eggs. And if you know anything about our park, we've got the marsh on this side, but where's most of the sandy habitat? It's on the other side of the highway over towards the dunes and the beach. So, about the end of May is uh, the beginning of peak nesting season. And unfortunately, what else happens at the end of May usually? It's uh, Memorial Day weekend and there's an increase in traffic all over this region. And so these terrapins are looking for places to nest and they might have over a dozen eggs to lay. And the last thing they want to worry about is looking both ways to see if they're going to be hit by a tractor trailer. Um, unfortunately, back in the early 2000s, there were many, many turtles being hit on the highway right here in our park. Um, it was really sad, it was, uh, it was stressful for park staff, park visitors were concerned, and so luckily our environmental stewardship team, which is based in our central office, uh, they came and worked on a project here to help reduce the terrapin mortality that was happening in the park. And so what they did, they created a, a turtle fence. Um, it's about yay high. And uh, they experimented. This is something our team had never done before. Um, but they wanted to build a fence on the bay side of the highway. And so they first started with uh, like a, a chicken wire, if you know what that looks like. And they thought, great, this is gonna keep the terrapins off the road. We're, we're in good shape. But wouldn't you know it, Terrapins are really good climbers. They actually climbed right up over that, that chicken wire. So the next test, they took uh, something more like the typical dune fencing, um, you know, with the, the skinny slats. And what happened was the terrapin would go right up next to the fence and they couldn't get through the slats like this, but they just turned sideways and scooted right through the slats. So um, that wasn't successful either. 
Um, it wasn't until they covered that dune fencing with like a, a, a landscaping fabric, um, and that seemed to do the trick. Um, you can see along the side of the highway, we have long stretches of this fence that's only about a foot and a half high. Um, it's that dune fencing, it's covered with that black uh, landscaping fabric, and that is our turtle fence. And that has worked wonders. Um, now we have access roads and things, we can't have a solid fence the entire stretch of the park, so occasionally a terrapin does make it out onto the road. But the terrapin mortality rates dropped dramatically after they constructed that fence. So, great, we solved one challenge. But you're probably thinking to yourself, yeah, that's all well and good, but now where are these poor females gonna lay all their eggs? Great question. So, uh, there's, there's two answers to that question. First, there's actually um, some sandy habitat, a, a decent amount of sandy habitat on the bay side, on the west side of the highway. And we see terrapins utilizing that all the time. Another thing that we did, um, or our environmental stewardship team did, they brought in a couple of dump truck loads of sand and they created an artificial uh, nesting habitat um, on the bay side of the park. And uh, I've been out there a couple times during nesting season. One time I walked out there for five minutes and I saw three terrapins nesting in, a, in just this small area. Um, so that has been very, very successful. Um, <clears throat> so, great. Now let's talk about frequently asked questions. We get a lot of questions uh, from park visitors about terrapins. And uh, the first thing is to do is, well, I, I saw a terrapin, what should I do? Nothing, let it be. These guys, these terrapins have been in our park long before we ever existed at a, as a park. They're doing just fine. Um, another common question we get is, well, I saw a terrapin laying eggs, what do I do? Again, not really anything. Um, they are, um, they're gonna be nesting all over the park and uh, a lot of people will ask, well, why don't, we, why don't we mark it with some flags or put a fence around it? Um, and and uh, one place where they nest a lot is in our campground. Uh, we have calls every May and June from people that are camping in the campground saying, a turtle just laid eggs in our site, what do we do? Um, and again, nothing. Uh, so we, there's been other research studies where they have marked uh, nests with like say flags, but some of the predators around here are pretty, pretty with it. And uh, they quickly learn, they recognize that flags mean prey. And so uh, for example, a fish crow can actually get right into the nest and eat all of the eggs. Um, so we don't wanna mark it um, with anything. Another question we get is, well, what about foot traffic? There's gonna be the next people who camp in the campsite where this turtle laid eggs, they're not gonna know it's there. Or what if they step all over it? Again, it's really actually nothing to worry about. The, the nest that the female digs can be up to eight inches deep. Um, and those eggs are not gonna be, they're probably gonna be only about five inches deep and covered with sand. Um, and just to uh, throw in a fun thing that, that happened about two years ago, we had a diamondback terrapin female laid eggs in the middle of the courtyard at the Indian River Life Saving Station Museum. And that was in early June. And by early September, we had hatchlings coming up. We found several of them and they, they, they survived. And it's funny because we actually use that site for weddings at times. And so these little eggs that turned into hatchlings survived an entire season of people dancing all over them. So really, if you see a terrapin laying eggs, the best thing to do is leave it alone. Um, I know some people have tried to take pictures of nesting terrapins or take video, um, but they can be shy. Um, you have, kind of have to sneak up behind them so that the female can't see, um, and uh, that could be pretty difficult. I have definitely tried to take a picture and, and the female caught me and, and stopped what she was doing and, and left. Um, okay, so we've overcome some challenges, great. Um, you know what to do if uh, you see a terrapin nesting, but let's talk about more, more about the nest itself. So the nest, again, I said we're about eight inches deep. The female, sometimes they can be a bit picky. They'll wander around on land until they find their perfect spot. 
and they dig that hole just using their hind legs. Um, it's very impressive to watch. And usually they lay somewhere around eight to 14 eggs. Um, they can lay more, but that's probably about the average. And those eggs, that nest of eggs, another scientific term if you want to impress your friends, is called a clutch. And the nest, uh, the eggs inside that clutch um, will take about 60 to 90 days to incubate and to hatch in the fall. Uh, when, they, when the hatchlings emerge, uh, they're about the size of a quarter, like I mentioned before, and uh, very, very small, easy prey. Usually they're going to be quick to uh, find some vegetation to hide in um, or find their way to the water. Um, <clears throat> the other side of that is sometimes the terrapins will actually hatch, if, especially if it's later in the fall, if it was a late nest, um, the terrapins will hatch, but they won't emerge out of the ground. They will actually overwinter inside the nest and they won't emerge until the first couple warm days in the spring. So usually if we get like a 75 degree day in early April, we start getting calls from staff and park visitors. Hey, I found a teeny tiny turtle. Um, that's because that turtle hatched last fall, but it chose to overwinter in the nest. And so if that happens, if you find a tiny turtle, the best thing to do is bring it to a marsh like this and, and put it, I usually put them in, in the grass near the water and then they could kind of choose if they want to hang out in the grass or if they would rather uh, swim into the bay. Okay, so the last thing that we can talk about, something that you all can do. The only time that you actually want to react if you see a turtle is when it's in a parking lot or headed onto the road. Um, that is one thing where you can step in and help that turtle out. And the thing, th there's a couple things you need to keep in mind. Let's say you're driving down the, the highway and you see a turtle on the shoulder, it's about to, to make its way into traffic. Um, what you want to do, pull over if it's safe. Obviously make sure it's safe for you first. Your safety is actually more important than the terrapins. Um, but if there's no traffic coming and you find it safe, um, you can actually pick up the terrapin. So I recommend picking it up by two hands and holding the mouth away from your body rather than the mouth being towards you. Um, they're pretty, they have a mild temperament for the most part. They're not like snapping turtles. They're not out to bite you. Um, just don't stick your finger in front of their mouth because they can bite. Uh, but for the most part, they're pretty docile. Um, you want to hold it with two hands, hold it firmly. Uh, sometimes they'll, they'll kind of shrink back into their shell a little bit because they're scared. Every once in a while you find, I found a terrapin that's just like flailing its arms everywhere, arms and legs, and, and those back legs have some claws that can kind of scrape your hands a little bit. It doesn't hurt too much, but just something to be aware of. So two hands, I like to keep my fingers on the bottom, thumbs on top. And what you're gonna do is move that turtle to the side of the road or the side of the parking lot in the direction it was headed. Even if that's across four lanes of traffic because if, the, if you decide, oh, it's, it's closer to go back over here, these guys are really stubborn. These terrapins, as soon as you get in your car and drive away, they're gonna turn around, come right back onto the highway. Um, so it's important to put them on the side of the road in which they were headed. But please only do that if it's safe for you. I can't stress that enough. Uh, the last thing, uh, next time you get to uh, wash your hands, please do so. Hand sanitizer, um, just, just good, good, uh, good to keep clean after you touch an animal. Um, okay, so I really hope you enjoy uh, learning about the Diamondback Terrapin. It is one of my favorite animals to see in our park. And uh, I hope you enjoyed learning about uh, why our park is good habitat and um, how we've overcome some of the challenges that they face here. Um, we hope to see you in the park one day and have a great day.